Well, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Uh, Daryl visited that in his meditation. That's a great passage. And hopefully you're going to get there as, at one point in time as well. And as you turn to chapter 8 of the book of Romans and 1118 in the Bibles in front of you, I just want you to, to, to remember the context of the book of Romans. Uh, you know, the book of Romans in chapter 1 really starts out really telling us some really bad news. The bad news is that we're all broken. The bad news is that we're all sinners. The all, bad news is that we all need a savior, that we all need to be fixed, that we all need to have a heart transplant. And so that's the bad news, but then the good news we discover is that we have a savior, a savior that wants to do all of that, that, that God is powerful God and he wants to transplant um, the Lord's heart into our heart. And, and so in this chapter one through, uh, chapters one through seven, we, we see what God has done to be able to remedy this issue of being separated from him and now that we can be united with him through the death, death burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And so because we've got this um, salvation, because we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, in chapter eight, Paul really begins to talk to us about how we can live our lives. We recognized uh, at the very beginning that if God is for us, who can be against us? And so we can live as if that we have the creator of the universe for us, on our team. He's rooting for us. He's our cheerleader. He's, one, he's the one that wants to help us through our days and help us through our challenges, help us through the seasons that are both the great season and, and the difficult seasons as well. Then we discovered in verse one that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that we can now live in a, in a, a life that is uh, forgiven and in grace and, and that there's no condemnation. That condemnation, that word there is that the debt has been paid, that what Jesus Christ has done on the cross has taken care of the guilt that we have been carrying being separated from our, our, our creator. Then in verse 5, we found that, that those living according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And so in order for us to really capture this gift, this reality of no condemnation, we really got to decide what are we going to focus on? What is our mind going to be uh, focused on a day-to-day -day basis? Are we going to be thinking about that of the natural desires? The things that are self-centered, are we going to live in accordance with the Spirit and have our set, mind set on what the Spirit desires? Then last week we discovered in verse 10, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This great reality that Christ is in you, Christ is in me, that we have this great relationship with the Heavenly Father because of what Christ did on the cross for you and me. So what does it mean then to have Christ in us? What does it mean then, how, how does that then provide us an identity that's different than the identity we had before we accepted Christ as Savior and Lord? And that's where I want us to pick up in verse 12 of the book of uh, Romans chapter eight. Therefore, brothers, we have, an we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death by the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you who did not receive a spirit makes you a slave again to fear, but receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Can you believe that? We're God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, hopefully every time you run across this little word called therefore, you recognize that that's a connecting word. That's a word that would connect us back to what he had just said. He just said in verse 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, you have an obligation. He's saying because of what God has done for you, what he has provided for you by what Christ did on the cross for you, we now have this, this thing called an obligation, if you will. This obligation is, is something that, that we, we owe a mortal debt to God for what he's done for us in giving our salvation. If we're living by the Spirit, we'll be putting to death then the deeds of our sinful nature. 
so that we can be able to live in the spirit of God. And so our obligation is to say, no more, no more sinful living. No more answering to that sinful nature. Now, I think sometimes we get kind of, at least I do anyway, I have, well, what's this sinful nature? Because really, to be honest with you, most of us kind of walk around realizing that, you know, we're, we're, we're just good people, really. So what's this sinful nature talking about, you know? Well, for my own self, the way I have to uh, begin to understand the sinful nature in me is, is just I live my life pretty much self-centered. The first mindset that I have, the, the default that I come to if I'm not living in the spirit is it's about Bob. It's about me. And, and we can really kind of test that just to see how often we get frustrated with things around us. When we're frustrated with some things around us, more often than not, maybe not always, but more often than not, it's because it's about you. And if it's about me, then I know that I'm not living in the spirit, but rather now I'm living back in to that sinful nature, that, that, that nature that looks, about, uh, that, that looks only at myself. And, and we, we, we know that on a daily basis then we need to put to death this, this self-centeredness, this self-righteousness, uh, this, this self-absorption, if you will. Paul told the, Coloss the church in Colossae in chapter 3, verse 5, put to death, therefore, whoever belongs to your earthly whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must get rid of also all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. The imagery that he's providing here, Paul's talking about, it's literally taking off this old self, like just you would like to take off your old clothes or, or take off your old cloak, that, that those rags, those filthy rags that we used to walk around in when in our self-centeredness. And we can identify some of those things as, as you know, like the code of anger, you know? Do, do you have, a, do you have a, a difficulty with anger? Uh, with malice, with slander, anything that is, that's making us the center of our universe, those are the, that's what we need to take off, if you will. But rather thou, we put on then, because of what Christ did on the cross, we put on the Spirit. And so that we're being renewed, so that we become like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is in us now, and now we can have the mindset on this, what the Spirit decides, and that means that then we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's declaring in verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God now are sons of God. And so as we're led by the Spirit of God, it rec helps us to realize and recognize that we have a new identity. That we're, we're children of God now. We're, we're the sons of God. That the most amazing truth thou can uh, transform our lives and this word is not only described by a young child, but an adult child who has all the rights, privileges that go with being an adult child in a family. Boy, if, if we could just understand this. We, we sang a song that uh, talks about befriended and, be, and befriend, and, and that we are now the friends of the, of the Savior. Jesus said in John 15, 15, when he was around the Last Supper with his apostles, I no longer call you servants, now I call you friends. You see, that's a phenomenal thing. But not only are we just friends, not only are we just acquaintances, not only are, is, is Jesus our best friend, but now we're related. We've been adopted into the family of God. John realized this gift when he wrote 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That word for lavish, it's like, it's, it's extravagant. It's, it's, it's like, you know, instead of buying your wife that, that $100 bouquet of roses, it's like buying your wife a $1,000 bouquet of roses. You're, you're being extravagant. He lavished this love on us that we should be called his kids. That's an awesome thing. Turn, turn to the person next to you say, you know, you're God's kid. That's a good thing. That's our identity. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, this idea of adoption has two truths that go together. The first truth is called 
the first truth is we, what we call uh, from a doctrinal position regeneration. And it's that experience of the new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And then again, he repeats that because Jesus is making sure that we understand that there's got to be this, this rebirth. There's got to be this transformation. There's got to be this from the old to the new. And he says in verse 5 of John 3, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. That's why we believe so strongly in baptism. Not that baptism saves you or the water saves you or anything like that. But because baptism is an opportunity for us to experience in a physical way the spiritual reality that we are no longer alive in our old selves, that we're buried into that watery grave. Our old self is dead. We we throw away the old rags that we are wearing, that that the old nature no longer has any control or power or authority over us. And we come back into life, new creations in Christ Jesus. And then we're born anew by the Spirit of God, that we're new creations with a new heavenly Father, if you will. The second truth is adoption. Paul states this truth, and and, um, or Paul is talking about then in this, in Romans chapter uh, eight, that we're now adopted. Regeneration literally means that you're a child of God, but adoption means that you're now legally a child of God. You see, at this time when this letter was uh, being written, the word adoption had a different connotation than it is today. Adoption today, we, th- we think about a child that doesn't have a parent, and parents come along and they adopt that child and makes them their own. But th- there was a, a different thing going on in the culture in the first century church, uh, the first century culture in that day. The biblical meaning of adoption needs to be understood from the Roman and the Greeks who had a ceremony that they went through with their own flesh and blood children, their own children. And that ceremony was called adoption, which literally means placing of a son. See, as long as a child was under the legal age of inheritance, they were not really considered to be full-fledged members of the family. They didn't have that, that position yet. And and it was a pretty harsh world back then. In fact, the father had the, op- um, the ultimate power over his kids. He, he could do anything with those kids. But once that child was an illegal age, he, he began to be able to have the rights and privileges of family membership. He became an adult, and there was an inheritance, and they went through a ceremony called the, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, but the toga viralis. And they would take the toga off the back of the adult, place it on the back of the child, and then pronounce them as a full-fledged member of the family with all the rights and privileges. So literally, when this uh, child came into a place of adulthood, the father would take his toga off and place it onto his child and say, now you are a man. Now you are fully adopted into the family and that you have now all the rights and privileges of my of of my being of, of me being your father as well as the inheritance that uh, my estate would have provide you and, and so there was a ceremony there one of the commentators said now i say as long as the heir is a child he does not differ from all uh, at all from a slave although he is the owner of everything but he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father and that's the date of the toga virales so the term adoption as sons is used as a ceremony of the Turgus Viralis, and it was uh, done only to the young men. So what we have here is a word picture, if you will, that, that Paul re- says that, you know, now that you have Christ in you, now that you have this new life in Christ Jesus, not only do you have salvation, not only do you have eternal life, but you now have a, a, have a new father, if you will. We find this in Galatians 4, 1 through 7, when Paul talks to the Galatian church, he says, what am I saying is that as long as you're an heir and under age, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the father. And also when we're under age, we were in the slavery under the elementary spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts and the spirit who calls out Abba Father so that you're no longer a slave but God's child. 
Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So in regeneration, we're born, uh, uh, we become literally born again with a new heavenly father. With adoption, we become the child of God legally. And that kind of happens simultaneously as we come to Christ and allow him to be our Lord and our Savior. So not only are we just being his kids, but now we also have that inheritance, if you will. Paul says then, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are the beloved child of a king. That means that we have all the, 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 all the riches that are associated with that inheritance and with that kingship, that we no longer have to be in fear, but rather we receive the spirit of sonship instead so that we can actually go into the presence of the creator of the universe and say, Abba, Father. Now, many of you, uh, maybe most of you have heard that, that um, it's an Aramaic um, uh, label that, that children would call their father. It's a very intimate term. It's, it, was, it has really no exact translation in English, but it's a term of endearment and deep respect like daddy. It's the term that Jesus used. Remember when he was in the garden and he was talking with his heavenly father and asking him if there was just some way that this cup could pass for him? Jesus used Abba as the term that he was addressing his heavenly father to. Think of it now. We're the children of God. And we now have the, have the blessing of being able to go to the Heavenly Father and with deep respect say, Abba, Daddy. We have that same intimate relationship and connection with Him. What a great encouragement. God is our loving Heavenly Father who hears and listens to His children. You know, what, cry, what father would ever ignore a child's cry? I know uh, we, we've got our grandkids here and, and, and we hear, you know, they, they'll start crying and immediately all of us are looking and saying, what's going on, what's wrong, what we can do to come alongside of you. Is it no less for our Heavenly Father when he hears us cry out? When we say, Abba, Father, he hears your heart, he hears your desires, he hears your struggles, he hears what it is that you need and he's there so that he can provide all that we need. The Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we're God's children. And being God's children means that we're a part of God's family. We have the gifts of having brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just, you know, this, this, as I was studying through this, this really came to mind. You know, it kind of grieves me right now, and I, and I hope I can say this in a positive way, but it grieves me today that we live in kind of a culture and people look at, um, you know, that, that going to church is, is, is really not that significant. It's not really that important. It's really not that, um, I don't know, maybe that much of a gift. Uh, part of that's because I think that, with, that that's really a, a, an old nature mindset because you're l- really looking at church as what am I going to get from it or what is it, what's in it for me? But you see, every Sunday morning, do you know what you're really coming to? Every Sunday morning at 1030 when you come to church, you're coming to a family reunion. I don't know about you, but I like family reunions. I like to, be, I, I had all my kids up. We celebrated Steph's birthday. Uh, she's uh, 29 uh, yesterday. And um, all my kids were up and, and our, our kids were up and, and we had a great time around the fire and had great food. I enjoy family reunions. Do you enjoy family reunions? Well, how can you have a family reunion if you don't show up? How, how can we enjoy the gift of brothers and sisters in Christ? I, I, I did a celebration this, this last week and the, my informant who was telling me about the person that passed away, he was the brother and he was talking about his sister and I had asked, well, what about our childhood? And he's like, well, I don't remember too much about the childhood. How about our teen years? No, not too much about his, you know. Well, how about our adult years and a vocation? Well, was, he knew a little bit more about her occupation and what she did. But, he, you know, he looked me in the eye and goes, you know, I, I really wasn't that close to her. I really don't know. And they didn't live that far apart. So what hit me was, how much do I know about my brothers and sisters in Christ? How much could I talk about you? And, and I want to challenge you. How much do you know about the brothers and sisters in Christ that you're sitting next to? How deep of a relationship do we have? What, what, kind, of, what, what kind of relationship are we developing? Because 
I, I got some really good news for you. Some of you may not think it's going to be good, but it's really good news. You and I are going to spend eternity together. Forever. And, and I think that begins right now. And so, yes, you know, you can go out on a boat and fish and, and nothing wrong with fishing, but that's not church. You can go to the beach and that's really not church. You can go up to the mountains and that's really not church because if you don't have your brothers and sisters around you, you're not in church. You're not experiencing the family reunion that God desires to have on a weekly basis. Let me take it one step further, and I, and I hope you hear this as the gift that God wants it to be in our lives. You know, if we're not spending some time in small groups where we can really get to know one another, we're missing the gift. If, if you're not coming to a, a small group Bible study on a weekly basis, we've got them on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and Wednesday mornings. Uh, so there's a small group probably that you could make uh, at one of those days of the week because that's where you can really get to know one another. That's when you can really understand a person's story. That's where you can really understand what God's doing in their life and what, uh, what God's doing in your life. And, and that's where we, we, we can encourage one another. We can bear one another's burdens and we can um, love one another and we can spur one another on to good works. You see, without that relationship, not only is it my relationship with the Heavenly Father that we are now children of God, we're his, a part of his family, but now we have also as adopted we have all these brothers and sisters in Christ. So my question this morning is, are you missing the gift? Are you missing the gift of a family reunion both on Sundays as well as a, a family reunion throughout the week as we are looking at God's word? You see, being a God's children it is more than just my relationship with him. It's my relationship with his family as well. So not only do we have this gift of being in relationship with one another, but we also then have all the, 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 all the gifts as being heirs of, with Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Praise be to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you live there? You know, I struggle to live there. I know this truth. I know that I believe this with my whole heart that all that, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is, is something that God wants to bless me with. But the thing is, am I available for that? It, or, or am I too much self-centered? Am I, am I stuck in my own world? Am I stuck in my, my old nature, if you will? Because if I have the mindset of Christ and if I put on the Christ and if, you know, I, you know, if I uh, really recognize my new identity in Christ, then God opens up the door for me to receive the spiritual blessings he has for me on a day-to-day -day basis. That might look different than the prayer concerns that I have for him, but what's more, what, what is greater, do you think, as far as a treasure? The, the, the thing that I pray about for him, to receive, to, for him to, to accomplish in my life or for me to be open to the spiritual blessings that he has for my life so that not only would I be blessed, but then I could be a blessing to others. You know, a Michigan factory worker earning less than $10,000 a day was unknowingly a hair, an heir to a half a million dollars. When located by an investor some years after his benefactor's death, the worker explained they had neither returned home nor kept in touch with his family for 24 years. The investigator who located him estimates there was about $40 billion in his inheritances lying unclaimed in this country alone. You know, we've got far more than $40 billion in spiritual blessings lying unclaimed because we don't ask God to bless us with what he has in store for our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's pray. Father, I, I don't think there's a... a a greater reality that uh, is so important for us to understand than our identity as being children of God. That you've adopted us. That we have all the rights and privileges of, of being a, a, of a child of the King. Father God, I pray that we would not miss the gift of all the blessings you have for us. That we wouldn't miss the gift of being your child. And Father, I just pray that right now, if there's somebody in this room that doesn't know your Son as Savior and Lord, that hasn't allowed themselves to be adopted by you, 
that this would be the morning that they would receive your Son as Savior and Lord, and they would begin their life for all eternity. Father, for most of us here, we've done that, made that choice, but help us to see the identity that you have for us as being children of God so that we might receive the blessings of the inheritance that you have for us. And we'd ask this in your son's powerful name.